case for a vaccine, inching closer to a new phase, distribution. In Brussels today, a dry run at the airport to make sure that hard hit country is ready to go whenever a vaccine is ready. And back here at home, growing indications tonight that it could be soon. But some are warning of a logistical nightmare to get it to the Americans who need it most. You're going to have a gap potentially in preparation and how long that gap lingers costs lives. We talked with the military's former COVID crisis planner about what he fears may be a long winter ahead. Right now, we are in a absolutely dangerous situation. This is not crying wolf. Officials sounding the alarm again tonight on holiday gatherings as we cross the grim milestone 250,000 Americans. Americans dead and the nation's largest school district pulls the plug on in-person learning effective immediately. And for some, getting the virus was just the beginning. My taste completely changed. I do get headaches and I am on a lot of medication. Our report tonight on the COVID long haulers still struggling months after testing positive. Transition stonewalling, the Trump administration still refusing to officially begin a presidential transition. A response from key Republicans tonight. And meet the Eagle Scout teenage girl breaking barriers tonight. I'm honored, honestly. I'm, you know, very happy that I would be able to be one of the first, or the first to be able to lead girls in that path. Good evening. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are coming to you tonight from Washington, D.C., where not too far from here, back in March, the president and his task force presented this chart, which showed that if proper mitigation was taken, anywhere from 100,000 to 240,000 Americans could die from COVID-19. And nearly eight months later, more than 250,000 Americans are dead with no immediate end in sight. As of this evening, 14 states do not have mask mandates. A mayor in Florida is begging the governor there to institute one as this pandemic surges out of control. Cases continue to rise and also growing tonight, optimism for an approved vaccine. And that's where we begin. Tom Yamas leads us off. Tonight, Pfizer fueling fresh hope after reporting trial results show its coronavirus vaccine is 95% effective, higher than first reported, and they say with no serious side effects. The company ready to ask the FDA for emergency authorization by Friday. When I heard the over 90% efficacy, uh, I felt that uh, I was living a dream. Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech found the vaccine was consistently effective across race, ethnicity and age. And it was 94 percent effective in people over 65, the group most vulnerable to COVID. Yugur Shaheen and his wife, Dr. Oslim Terechi, co-founded BioNTech and developed the vaccine. This new technology, this messenger RNA vaccine, appears to work as well in elderly people as in young adults. It's the same groundbreaking genetic science used in Moderna's vaccine, which early results show is nearly 95% effective. But Pfizer faces a unique challenge. Their vaccine has to be stored at minus 94 degrees. It's stored in these freezer farms. Vials will be packed with dry ice in boxes like these and shipped around the world the moment Pfizer gets the green light. The general in charge of vaccine distribution for Operation Warp Speed insists it can be done. Don't be afraid of the refrigeration requirement. The capability exists. If more is needed, uh, the capability exists to purchase and have it delivered in a timely manner. A new Gallup poll taken before the latest news from Pfizer and Moderna showed 58% of the adults asked were willing to be vaccinated, up from 50% in September. But Dr. Anthony Fauci says we need to get at least 75% of the population vaccinated to get the pandemic under control. What I would like to see is the overwhelming majority of people get vaccinated so we could essentially really crush this right. outbreak. And with new hope for a vaccine, there is new hope on the horizon for testing. The FDA giving emergency authorization to an at-home test from Lucera. The self-administered nasal swab kit gives an answer in just 30 minutes or less, but access will be limited.
that at-home test offering more relief and potential optimism for many. Tom Yamas joins us now from outside of a Pfizer manufacturing site in Andover, Massachusetts. Tom, Pfizer says as soon as the FDA says yes to its request for emergency authorization, it will start moving the vaccine immediately. Do we have any idea how quickly the FDA could say yes? That's the big question tonight, Lindsay. Well, the FDA is going to review the data. They're going to have a public hearing, and then the authorization could take two to four weeks. If approved, the Pfizer vaccine could be given to up to 10 million Americans, maybe a little more by the end of the year. And we want to point out, Lindsay, just behind us, as you mentioned, this is a Pfizer plant. The vaccine is being made right now as we broadcast to you just outside the Boston area. We can see a lot of cars in the parking lot. They are working late here. They're working hard. They want to get this right, Lindsay. Tom Yamas, thanks so much. And despite all the new developments surrounding two possible vaccines, one harsh reality remains. The cases of COVID are rising and so are the deaths. More than a quarter of a million Americans losing their lives. Even as scientists stress the importance of distancing and wearing a mask to prevent more deaths, more than a dozen states still do not have a mask mandate. ABC's Stephanie Ramos now on the ongoing battle against COVID as we approach the holiday season. Tonight, in a sign of this worsening emergency across the country, New York City, the original coronavirus epicenter, forced to shut down schools again. The mayor saying the COVID test positivity rate hit the 3% seven-day average, forcing more than a million students back to online learning full-time. And I want to emphasize to parents, to educators, to staff, to kids, that we intend to come back and come back as quickly as possible. Today's abrupt decision coming at the end of the school day, sparking anger and confusion. Students and parents given just hours to prepare for tomorrow. Tomorrow, my daughter is going to wake up in a city where the children in our neighborhood that attend private schools, that attend Catholic schools, and attend charter schools will still have their schools open and my daughters will be closed. The city now joining districts like Los Angeles, Chicago, and San Francisco that have been fully remote this entire school year. And it's not just the major cities. Some schools in Kentucky and Minnesota switching to virtual school as well. And all this as the nation marks that devastating toll. More than 250,000 Americans killed by COVID. Right now, we are in a absolutely dangerous situation. This is not crying wolf. And tonight, Michigan and Oregon, among several states, reimposing restrictions. Governors issuing new warnings to rethink Thanksgiving gatherings. From New York. You know what love is on Thanksgiving? I love you so much, and I'm so thankful for you, that I'm not going to see you. To Massachusetts. Today, we're urging everybody to make a difficult choice this Thanksgiving. The CDC urging families to only celebrate with members of their own household. But if more guests are invited, stay outside or open windows inside. Don't gather for long periods of time and keep the gathering small so guests can stay six feet apart and wear masks. As families prepare, grocery stores are running low on supplies. Some chains issuing new purchasing limits on cleaning supplies and toilet paper. But the holiday celebration taking a back seat for the hundreds of thousands of frontline health care workers with nearly 77,000 Americans battling the virus inside hospitals, a new record. I feel like I'm in that fight or flight mode, having my patient call their family member before we intubate for the last time, um, for the last video message. And, uh, and then the silence that follows after is, it's really hard. And in a sign of how many doctors and nurses may be nearing a breaking point, nearly 900 workers testing positive at the Mayo Clinic. Arkansas, one of 19 states hitting record hospitalizations. The governor with a sobering warning about how many more people could die by the end of the year. That if Arkansas continues at the present pace over the last two days, then Arkansas will have an additional 1,000 Arkansans that will die as a result of COVID-19 between now and Christmas. Wyoming reporting a staggering 90% positivity rate, the highest in the country. The virus claiming more than 1,000 American lives every day. George Longoria, a beloved Houston Astros security guard, lost his life to COVID. George's daughter, Lauren, with a blunt message for anyone taking the virus lightly. I can't tell you the amount of people, friends of my dad, 
who have said, oh, I didn't take it seriously before your dad. Like, I didn't know anyone else who got it. Sorry, it took my dad for you to die for you to take it seriously. Right. So many simply not taking this virus seriously until it's too late. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, is there any sense that this could just be the beginning of further restrictions, considering that cases continue to surge? Well, absolutely, Lindsay, especially here in New York. We heard from Governor Andrew Cuomo today where he said he's predicting a tremendous spike in COVID cases uh, here across the state, especially after Thanksgiving. He says there could be more restrictions on New York City, on businesses, houses of worship and gatherings if these COVID cases continue to rise. Now, gyms and hair salons, for instance, could be forced to close. And he said restaurants will be allowed to stay open but offer only outdoor dining, limited to parties of four and takeout. But we're seeing this across the country. We're hearing from governors uh, who are clamping down on mask mandates. So this could very well be the beginning of a second wave. Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. And now to new research on the devastating long-term effects some experience with COVID-19. More than a million Americans could have symptoms for weeks or even months after contracting the virus. ABC's Ariel Reshev takes a look at post-COVID treatment centers and community groups popping up across the country to help these so-called long haulers. For new mom, Reina Lopez, her 100-day battle with COVID-19 has been a protracted, brutal nightmare. I had a fever, I had chills, um, I would get very dizzy and lightheaded when I would, any movement, sitting down, standing up, just turning my head, um, I was getting nauseous, my body was hurting. I thought I was just gonna go in for a few days and then go back home, but I was asleep most of the time. Um, so I don't remember any of that part, I was just dreaming. The disease sending the 31-year-old to a Tempe, Arizona hospital back in June, just released at the end of October after months in the ICU on a ventilator, isolated from her newborn baby Noah, her two older daughters, and her husband, Rodolfo. Our life got flipped upside down, you know. Uh, we have three kids. My, my four-year-old kept asking, where's mommy, where's mommy, and I had it, you know, told her, you know, she's sick and, and you know, she's fighting. Like many of the 11 million Americans infected with the virus, Reina is a so-called long hauler. Just focus on that breathing. Still experiencing symptoms days or even months after testing negative for the disease. Are you also dealing with, you know, any of the symptoms of COVID-19 still? I still am on oxygen. Um, I try not to be as much. That way I can get my lungs stronger. But I, my taste completely change. So there's a lot of foods that I don't eat anymore, that they were my favorite. I do get headaches and I am on a lot of medication, so that's overwhelming itself. According to recent studies, an estimated 10% of people diagnosed with COVID will go on to become long haulers. That means more than 1 million Americans potentially experiencing debilitating symptoms well after overcoming the virus itself. The alarming phenomenon prompting the creation of post-COVID care centers from coast to coast to treat patients suffering long-term effects. Uh, shortness of breath, uh, bouts of tachycardia or you know rapid heartbeats, that's unexplained. Uh, you have patients with uh, cognitive dysfunction, you have difficulty concentrating, having very bad fatigue, and also patients who are very deconditioned, you know, uh, just maybe from quarantine or maybe just from the illness itself. Dr. Zijen Chen is the director of the Mount Sinai Post-COVID Care Center in New York City, the first of its kind in the country. It was launched in May as the city was still reeling from the apex of the virus. Many of these patients admitted to the hospital, they needed some sort of follow-up. I mean, these were very, very sick patients, many of them in the ICUs. And because of that, we wanted to make sure that when they went home, that they had a good landing place and that we're continuing their care. And with the tidal wave of COVID cases across the nation, demand for post-disease care is exploding. I think what the centers do is they act as a place where patients can go to learn about their symptoms and get treatment so that they're not seeking care from everywhere, including the hospital. Hi everyone, this is day eight of my Corona journal. 46 year old Long Island, New York, mom of two, Diana Barrett is a coronavirus survivor. 
While in quarantine back in March, she says she felt starved for information about what the virus was doing to her body. I went into isolation in one world and I came out to a very, very different world. And while I was in isolation, you know, it gives you a lot of time to think and you have a novel virus and you have no information whatsoever. Um, so she founded Survivor Corps, a nationwide group of COVID survivors who crowdsource their firsthand knowledge of life after COVID. The group's Facebook page now has nearly 120,000 members sharing experiences, advice and support. Many fighting long term COVID symptoms report feeling anxious or depressed. Diane Anna says her community helps survivors feel a little less alone. Sometimes you just need to talk to somebody who understands what you're going through, and Survivor Corps offers that. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that there was no institutional system to, you know, to play that role. But, you know, where there doesn't exist something, you have to create it. And the group also helping researchers examine trends in the long hauler population. A recent survey by Survivor Corps and Indiana University School of Medicine found that fatigue is the most common of the top 50 symptoms experienced by long haulers, followed by muscle and body aches, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, and difficulty concentrating. And according to Mount Sinai Health System, the majority of their long hauler patients are 20 to 40 years old, most often women, and most have no known underlying conditions. Dr. Chen says scientists are still trying to figure out the best care for long haulers and stresses that we should try to avoid getting COVID-19 in the first place. The disease itself, COVID, is very real. Listen to your doctors and your you know, health officials. Wear a mask and social distance because the best way to prevent yourself from getting long-term symptoms is actually to prevent yourself from getting COVID in the first place. As for Reina, she says she's slowly turning the corner and soaking up precious time with her family. What gives you hope? New research. <laughs> Maybe we can get rid of this and then my kids keep me going. My husband thinks I'm spoiling them, but I'm just making up for it. <laughs> so. My message is that just just keep, keep your faith um, and look for motivation in your loved ones and and hopefully, you know, we can all get through this here soon. Ariel Reshef, ABC News, New York. Glad to hear she is starting to turn the corner. Our thanks to Ariel for that. And now to the transition stonewall from the Trump administration tonight. President-elect Biden warning that this delay could in turn slow down distribution of a vaccine. Our Jonathan Carl reports. Today, President-elect Biden warned President Trump's refusal to begin the transition process threatens to delay efforts to combat the resurgent coronavirus pandemic and distribute a vaccine. There's a whole lot of things that are just we just don't have available to us, which unless it's made available soon, we're going to be behind by weeks or months. Today, Biden heard emotional stories from frontline workers who described a lack of supplies and testing. Do you know that I have not been tested yet, and I have been on the front lines in the ICU since February? You're kidding me. No. Some Republicans are calling on the president to, at the very least, give President-elect Biden access to briefings. But most Republicans in Congress remain silently on the sidelines. For his part, the president has said nothing about the alarming surge in coronavirus cases and hospitalizations across the country. His Twitter feed has been dominated by baseless tweets, insisting that he won the election and that there is voter fraud all over the country. That's just not true. The president's legal team has been losing over and over again, failing to offer any credible evidence to back up the president's allegations. The Trump team has lost or withdrawn 14 separate lawsuits. In Michigan, where Biden beat Trump by more than 150 votes, two Republican officials in Wayne County briefly refused to certify the election, a move that would have tossed out all votes in the city of Detroit. That prompted an angry public outcry, including on a public forum over Zoom. You talked about not certifying Detroit, even though you acknowledge that Livonia, a city, by the way, 
I know you know is 95% white, had bigger variances than Detroit, which is 80% black. We understand. Just know when you try to sleep tonight, the law isn't on your side. History won't be on your side. Your conscience will not be on your side. And Lord knows, when you go to meet your maker, your soul is going to be very, very warm. The two Republicans quickly backed down and certified the election results. The simple truth, there is no evidence of widespread voter fraud. As Christopher Krebs, the top cybersecurity official at the Department of Homeland Security, said last week, quote, the November 3rd election was the most secure in American history. For that, he was fired. The president tweeting overnight that Krebs had been terminated effective immediately. Right, and many of us don't know exactly what to call this new normal. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, so day after day, we're starting to hear more concerns from Republicans in Congress, but is there anything that they can do in order to get the Trump administration to cooperate with the president-elect? Well, I mean, I suppose what we could see, what, what might have an impact uh, possibly is if you had more Republicans coming out and actually saying yes, recognizing the fact Joe Biden is the president-elect and therefore uh, should be given these briefings. But it's ultimately an action that has to be taken by the Trump administration. Uh, Kamala Harris, however, is uh, still a United States senator and she is still a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So in that capacity, she can have access uh, to intelligence briefings uh, as a senator. And John, word today the Trump campaign has paid for a partial recount in Wisconsin. As you mentioned, there is no evidence of any widespread voter fraud anywhere, and we've seen legal defeat after defeat. From your sources, are they telling you what the mood is inside the White House? Do people close to the president admit at this point that it's over? I mean, that has been my sense, actually, Lindsay, for some time, and yet we still keep uh, slogging along because the president himself is not ready to give up this fight. I thought the Wisconsin move was an interesting one because Wisconsin's a state where when the margin is as close as it was, uh, the Trump campaign is in its rights to ask for a recount, but they must pay for that recount. Uh, so they decided against doing a full statewide recount, which would have cost the campaign $8 million. Instead, they're doing this partial recount just of the two most heavily populated counties, by the way, counties that just so happen to be heavily Democratic. Uh, but you know, look, I mean, my sense almost across the board talking to the president's uh, advisors is that they know, as well as everybody else, that this is over, that Joe Biden is the president-elect. All right, Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. And when we come back, three bodies discovered near the New Mexico border. And now the question, who are they and how did they die? This is police search for a suspect nicknamed Psycho. Thousands up in arms over tighter COVID restrictions clashing with police, we'll tell you where. But up next, two crashes, five months apart, hundreds dead. But now Boeing is once again allowed to fly the 737 MAX. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart not. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Ismael? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Anger is growing in Germany tonight. Protests in Berlin turned violent after thousands turned out to protest that nation's tighter COVID restrictions. Police used smoke grenades and water cannons to disperse the crowd. Many of the demonstrators clashing with police in riot gear. At least 200 people were arrested and 10 officers injured. Cleared for travel. That was the message from the Federal Aviation Administration to Boeing for its 737 MAX 20 months after it was grounded. The planes were banned from travel, of course, after those two fatal crashes, faulty software and company and government failures were blamed. But tonight, the question, what's next for the company and what exactly has changed? Gio Benitez has more. Tonight, one of the longest aircraft groundings in history is over. After 20 months of scrutiny, the FAA approving the 737 MAX to return to the skies. Its name alone may conjure up these images. Two crashes just five months apart, killing 346 people. Based on all the activities that we've undertaken during the past 20 months and my personal experience flying the aircraft, I can tell you now that I am 100% comfortable with my family flying on it. But for some of the families of those who died, that's not enough. We don't have our loved ones. Michael Stumo lost his daughter Samia in one of the MAX crashes and is still demanding more transparency from both Boeing and the FAA. The culture of secrecy continues and, um, you know, this is a plane that I would advise people to, to not fly in the future because, uh, because we don't know if the fixes have, have, have done the job. In October 2018, Lion Air Flight 610 was airborne for only 13 minutes before it plunged into the Java Sea off the coast of Indonesia. Less than five months later, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 crashed near Addis Ababa Airport just six minutes after takeoff, killing all. An automated flight control system called MCAS misfired multiple times in both crashes, leaving pilots struggling to regain control and altitude of the plane. The system system was not mentioned in the pilot manual. Boeing not only fixing that flaw, but rewriting the entire flight computer software and requiring simulator training for all MAX pilots. Its CEO calling the MAX safer than the safest airplane flying today. ABC News contributor Steve Ganyard has been following the changes since the beginning. The FAA went back and mandated changes to the software, mandated changes to the way that information was displayed in the cockpit, mandated changes to the way crews were trained. So this is a very different airplane. It's a much safer airplane. And pilots like Captain Dennis Tager assuring the public he won't fly until he is confident in the fixes and has had training on the MAX. We have to see the full training on it. Um, we'll go fly that airplane, but we'll fly it on our terms because we don't fly any airplane unless we believe the airplane is safe. It has been vetted and we are robustly trained. And it will take the airlines several weeks to get pilots fully trained. And while airlines are eager to get these planes in the air, Boeing still has a long road ahead. The MAX will be the most tested commercial airplane ever built. But the real challenge will be for Boeing, which has lost the trust of the flying public, regaining that trust and having the public believe that they have made an airplane that is finally safe and that people are comfortable on paying for and flying with their families. American Airlines plans to be the first to fly the MAX commercially in 2020 on December 29th. United and Southwest will wait until later in 2021. Gio Benitez, ABC News, New York. All about regaining that trust. Our thanks to Geo. Still ahead here on Prime, we're getting a clear picture of all the devastation from that monster storm, Hurricane Iota. The death toll is mounting and the rescues from flash flooding continues. The rapper on top of a bus waving a flamethrower. Spoiler alert, it did not end well for him. We'll explain. Canada had their version of Thanksgiving a few weeks back. What happened next in their fight against COVID? But first, 
Our tweet of the day, like father, like son. Greg Anthony watching a game back with his son in the 90s. Tonight, he will watch him get drafted into the NBA. Good luck to all the future players on their big night. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. A last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people who just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. The first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night, 24-7. ABC News, there for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. At this point, we all know the concern from health officials. Thanksgiving spent with friends and family could lead to Christmas alone and fighting for your life in the hospital. Canada has done a much better job than the U.S. of containing this virus. And a few weeks back, they had their own version of Thanksgiving. Trevor Ault has more on what happened next. It's host to some of our most cherished traditions of food, friends, and family, but health experts say this year we'll have to celebrate Thanksgiving at a distance or the consequences could be dire. We have much higher rates of community prevalence, so we have uh, an increased risk for everybody who is having an in-person Thanksgiving holiday gathering. And we could have a troubling preview of what's to come from our neighbors to the north. Canada already celebrated their version of Thanksgiving the second Monday in October. And after the holiday there, Canadian officials saw a sharp increase in cases, their highest infection rate since the spring, with experts saying family gatherings were at least partially to blame. And the U.S. could be serving up an even larger recipe for disaster. With several times more cases per capita than Canada, America's Thanksgiving week is still expected to be the busiest travel week since the pandemic started. AAA predicts just a 10% decrease from last year, meaning 50 million Americans are still expected to travel to Thanksgiving gatherings. I would ask people to strongly consider if they do have um, kids coming home from college, family members traveling from elsewhere, that they don't get together for those in-person intergenerational gatherings. Officials across the country now pleading for people to take that message to heart. So how can you still give thanks safely? The CDC says even in small groups, masks and social distancing are still important. And getting tested ahead of time to avoid wearing your mask will only give you a false sense of security. An outdoor meal is best, but if you have to be indoors, open up your windows. And while it might be tradition to serve food buffet style, don't share utensils when you're filling up your plate. Our thanks to Trevor for those tips. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. Two highly effective potential COVID vaccines. But what now? If they are approved, how will they get to the general public? One former military official explains this is going to be far harder challenge than advertised. Have you heard about the genius dog challenge? Perhaps you haven't. Well, we'll tell you all about it, plus the scientific research behind it. Plus, meet the 51-year-old mother who gave birth to her own granddaughter. 
Hour. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Session of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So, this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Yes. Ismail? Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. of cars in cities from coast to coast. People waiting to get tested for COVID-19 as the demand for testing soars. I passed the two hour mark an hour ago. Labs struggling to keep up, but overnight the FDA approved the first at-home rapid test, which experts say is a step in the right direction. Also a sign of hope, Pfizer's vaccine moving along at lightning speed, with new data showing it's more than 95% effective for all ages, races, and ethnicities. The drug maker expected to request FDA emergency authorization in a matter of days. The U.S. seeing its highest caseload since the pandemic began. We do need to close our schools for the coming days. New York City's entire public school system, the largest in the country, temporarily shutting down again, beginning Thursday as cases surge, moving exclusively to remote learning instead. We intend to come back and come back as quickly as possible. Hurricane Iota now dissipating over Central America. That number of deaths uh, now at 26 across six different countries. Iota battered the Nicaragua's Caribbean coast and flooded parts of the Honduras that were still underwater from Hurricane Ada. Homes and buildings were badly damaged and trees were uprooted. Iota has weakened, but it is still causing catastrophic flash flooding. The number of deaths could grow as officials assess the damage. The federal judge in New York agreed to drop drug charges against Mexico's defense minister. The office stands behind the case, acting U.S. Attorney Seth Ducharme said, but he told the judge there was a broader interest in the U.S.-Mexico relationship that caused Attorney General Barr to drop the charges against former Mexican defense minister Salvador Cienfuegos Cepeda. Cienfuegos had been accused of taking bribes to protect a cartel that flooded the U.S. with illicit drugs. The judge said she had no reason to doubt the decision was made as a matter of foreign policy and the determination that Mexico sincerely wants to pursue an investigation. Mexican authorities have yet to say whether they'll prosecute. A rapper caught on camera blasting a flamethrower. Yes, a flamethrower onto an MTA bus in Brooklyn. Has turned himself into police. A video posted on social media showed rapper Dupree G.O.D. jumping on the roof of the bus and shooting the flames into the air. The MTA says there were 25 people on that bus, but no one was injured. He says the incident was part of a video shoot and no one was ever in danger. Heart? 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 Heart. 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 That's, that's some dangerous heart. 
Everything was a safe, controlled environment. It was for the art. It's for the thing. In a statement, the MTA called the incident absurd, <laughs> dangerous, and just plain stupid. Police are investigating after other videos were found showing Dupree G.O.D. using the flamethrower. Border Collies are competing in the Genius Dog Challenge to determine the world's smartest dog. Scientists in Hungary say that the challenge is part of a bigger project to learn how dogs perceive human language. Because of coronavirus, the clever canines are participating virtually. The winner will be announced next month. Welcome back. Police in Colorado have a mystery on their hands. What happened to three people found near the New Mexico border? Police are now searching for this man right here, Andre Jordan Burroughs. His nickname is Psycho. He is considered armed and dangerous and wanted in connection with the three deaths. Police say it could take weeks to identify the victims in this case. Now back to those hopeful COVID-19 vaccine results from drug makers Pfizer and Moderna. What comes next? Here's ABC's Bob Woodruff with the latest installment of Vaccine Watch. As we hurtle toward a vaccine, two companies, Moderna and Pfizer, now revealing promising data that their vaccines could be up to 95% effective. This is a really strong step forward to where we want to be. Pfizer, along with his partner, BioNTech, announced just this morning that they will ask the FDA for authorization within days. We plan to submit the documents to the FDA end of this week. Moderna, slightly behind, has said it will apply in the coming weeks, but they potentially have one key advantage, logistics. Our vaccine appears to be able to be distributed in much more traditional uh, infrastructure, so traditional refrigerators and freezers. and doesn't require dry ice or the types of ultra, ultra cool distribution. Um, that have report, been reported with the Pfizer vaccine. Experts say Moderna's vaccine may be easier to distribute in rural areas, locations which may not be suited to store Pfizer's vaccine. Some of those cold chain storage issues that people have brought up with the Pfizer vaccine could be alleviated by this vaccine. This is good news for places that may not have access to that ultra cold storage. Supplies will be limited at first to only 20 million people by the end of the year. And the first wave of people to be vaccinated will be frontline workers and those at high risk. They likely won't be able to pick which vaccine they get. At the present time, we're going to be really limited in the number of doses. So people who get offered one should feel quite happy about that, I would think. Although these two companies are the first to release their results, there could be more coming. Nearly 50 companies in human trials worldwide many using different technologies. Well, let's talk about the different kinds of vaccines that are being developed. There's four main approaches that are currently being researched for COVID-19 vaccines. The first is what I kind of describe as a traditional approach. These are inactive or weakened viruses. The second approach is called a viral vector approach. And that uses a different virus like a Trojan horse to get genetic material into your body. The third approach that's being researched is called a protein subunit approach, and that basically injects that spike protein directly into your body to produce that immune response. The fourth way is potentially one of the most exciting ways. It's a brand new technology, and that approach is called messenger RNA, mRNA. This is Pfizer and Moderna. It gives your body instructions to produce that critical spike protein, and that triggers an immune response, which creates those antibodies to fight off the virus. Who do you think is going to win, Moderna or Pfizer? I think that Pfizer will get their FDA authorization first, and Moderna will follow. But we honestly need both of them to succeed because we have so many infections in this country and the pandemic is so out of control. I'm Bob Woodruff, tracking the race for a vaccine. Our thanks to Bob Woodruff. Now let's take a deeper dive into how these vaccines could be distributed to hundreds of millions of Americans. We bring in retired Lieutenant Colonel Chris Alexander, who was a COVID crisis planner for the military's Northern Command. Thanks so much for joining us, Lieutenant Colonel. Hi, how are you? Good, good to be here. I'm well. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Question for you, how viable will it be to get the vaccine to all Americans, even those living in remote or rural communities, as we mentioned in our last segment? 
Wow. So that's going to, that, that is the, that is the really tough question that I wrote about is, is that when you start looking at the, the logistical requirements uh, of a vaccine and particularly the Pfizer vaccine, which requires, you know, this ultra cold storage, that really remains to be the question is like, how do we get a, you know, a vaccine that's going to be tough to store and tough to transport into the most remote corners of America, uh, like uh, Lipscomb County, Texas, which I wrote about in my article. And could the U.S. face shortages of essential distribution supplies like dry ice and ultra-cold freezers like the PPE shortages that we saw in the spring? Well, that's the fear, right, is that, is that you know, we, we, you know we, we are in the midst of a transition to a new administration. Uh, you know, there's a lot of lack of uh, federal leadership from the top. And the last time we went through through this was when the PPE and there were shortages and state and local governments were left, you know, scrambling to fill in the gaps. And so uh, it's hard to identify whether there's a plan to uh, provide the dry ice, provide uh, ultra cold freezers uh, to places that don't have it. I mean, uh, you know, typically those are two items that you don't have a lot of. And, uh, you know, and so I, I really haven't seen a lot of information in my research on this about you know what's the plan to fill in this gap? I, I know I read an article in USA Today today that uh, I think it's North or North or South Dakota is considering buying its own dry ice plant in order to, to make up this gap. So uh, that that's how, how people are looking at this problem, and uh, and and it's there's no good answers. Well, President Trump has suggested that it'll be the military that distributes the vaccine. Let's take a listen. We have a vaccine that's coming. We have uh, Operation Warp Speed, which is the military is going to distribute the vaccine. Now, you worked in the military's COVID crisis operation. Is the military prepared to pull this off and effectively? I, I, I don't think so. And it's not because, you know, we have a, you know, a great military. I spent, you know, my entire adult life up to this point in uniform. However, it's, it's limited. So there's, you know, and there's several factors. One, the military is not designed to take the lead in this. We always have always planned to be the supporting role to to uh, to civil authorities. So it's it's just kind of I don't think it's it's right to think that uh, that the military could somehow come in and and uh, replicate uh, what state and local governments do. Second, you know, uh, the military is going to have a pretty big lift in this as well. You've got to think. The military now is going to have to plan how do we get the vaccine all across the globe to all our troops and their families in remote locations everywhere. And then the third thing is you've seen all this chaos and churn that's going on in the Pentagon right now. Uh, and, you know, these orders to withdraw out of Iraq and Afghanistan, that is going to be a big lift for the planners. And there's only so many. So, you know, I don't think we can count on the military to blanket the country with resources. When I was at NORTHCOM, we knew we could surge resources to problems, but that we couldn't blanket the country with them. I mean, there's just so much we can do. Uh, so, so, yeah, I just I, I don't think uh, I don't think the president's right here. I think he's tweeting and then uh, and then maybe his advisors are are telling him uh, telling him the truth, which he didn't like to hear. And the Pentagon, of course, just announced a major drawdown of U.S. troops from Iraq and Afghanistan by mid-January. Could that operation potentially consume time and resources that could have gone toward vaccine distribution? Well, I mean, that, that, that's, hard, that's hard to tell. Uh, domestically, you know, I, I don't know, because, uh, you know, it it's, would be CENTCOM's responsibility to plan that withdrawal, right? And also CENTCOM's responsibility to plan how to get the vaccine out to the troops that are still in the field. Uh, NORTHCOM has the responsibility for the Defense Support to Civil Authorities mission, which, you know, I worked on. So, I, but really what happens is when all those plans and all those efforts, they, they flow into the Pentagon. And the Pentagon's the approval. The Pentagon's going to, you know, the Pentagon's going to have to review them. And I, I just wonder if all, all the, you know, the people who do that type of thing are going to be consumed in this churn. Now, when you were planning for the COVID crisis, did you factor in that some people won't want to take the vaccine or the anger out there about this virus and how the government has handled it? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, that's that is a that's a tough question and kind of, you know, that that's kind of beyond the military purview. Right. But as a as a citizen, sure, I'm concerned that, that you know, that people won't take it and will have lingering pockets of this vaccine for months and maybe years to come. 
what it's really going to take is, uh, you know, from the new administration is going to take a pretty good communications campaign to convince people that it's safe, assuming that it's safe, and to take it and be good citizens and do it and protect each other. And lastly, President Trump, of course, refuses to concede the election to President-elect Joe Biden and officially begin the transition process. How do you think that impacts preparations for vaccine distribution? Really, you, you're going to have a gap potentially in preparation and how long that gap lingers costs lives. So you really want a seamless thing. Uh, President-elect Biden has said, you know, he wants to be ready to, to go on day one. He's putting his team together and, and lives are at stake. So the clock's ticking and, and the longer the transition takes and, and the less the, you know, the outgoing team and the incoming team talk, the more problems we'll have as a nation. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Alexander, thanks so much for your insight and expertise here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Now some big news from Amazon. The internet giant is jumping into the pharmacy business, which could spark dramatic change in how we get prescriptions filled and how much we pay for them. Our Becky Worley has the latest. Introducing Amazon Pharmacy. Once we have Amazon is expanding what it brings to your doorstep. Daily. Now you can get your meds delivered just like everything else. The company's latest venture, Amazon Pharmacy. Prescription medications delivered right to your home. The online prescription world is now something that is so much more viable than it was, say, even just five years ago. More people are just accustomed to ordering things online. Using what Amazon calls a secure pharmacy profile, customers can store their insurance and payment information, manage prescriptions, and place unlimited orders for Prime members, which costs $119 a year. Free two-day delivery is included in your membership. Amazon also announcing it's now offering deep discounts for Prime members that don't have insurance, which could save those customers up to 80% off generic medications and up to 40% off brand name medications. The company also partnering with more than 50,000 pharmacies like CVS, Walgreens, Costco, and Walmart to extend that deal to some of their stores. So you have the option to shop local. You just need to present your Amazon prescription card at checkout. Many of those existing pharmacies already offer delivery services, and there are other standalone companies that provide the same type of delivery services like Capsule in New York, Now RX in Northern California and parts of Arizona, and ZipDrug for Medicaid insurance holders. What people are counting on is their comfort and ease with Amazon, and that if you're a Prime member, you're already paying for Prime delivery of your other staples. Our thanks to Becky for that. And now to a very heartwarming story. One mother's gift to her daughter, who she watched struggle with infertility for years. Kana Whitworth has the story of a 51-year-old mother who stepped in to become a surrogate. Hi, honey. Brianna and Aaron Lockwood have a gorgeous baby daughter, just 16 days old. But Brianna didn't give birth to her. Her 51-year-old mom, Julie, did. I just wanted to see her become a mom. That's, that was my goal. Brianna's infertility journey started soon after she got married in 2016. We started trying right away, but unfortunately it didn't really work out for us. After struggling to conceive for a year, they saw a fertility specialist, underwent multiple rounds of IVF, and had several miscarriages. Finally, her doctor recommended surrogacy, which can be expensive. The Lockwoods couldn't afford it. That is, until Brianna's mom stepped in. I literally just shot her a text and said, hey, you know, I would love to be your surrogate. And she's like, mom, no, <laughs> you're crazy. It took some convincing. Brianna didn't think it was possible. But after speaking with her doctor, Julie, a marathon runner, was cleared to be the gestational carrier. Friends and family completely supportive. There was no doubt. Everyone knew, you know, that she was the perfect person to be able to do this. I just, I wanted to do it. So I think I just went into it with a really positive attitude that it was going to work. In February, the first embryo transfer was a success. But after so many losses, she wasn't ready to celebrate just yet. As the age of the gestational carrier increases, you're going to have an increase in risk throughout that pregnancy, namely gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, sometimes preterm labor. We were still holding our breath a lot for that first trimester, even well into the second one before we got excited. 
excited. Brianna finally let her guard down when her mom was 20 weeks pregnant. It was really fun just to, you know, experience a pregnancy, feeling the baby kick and knowing it's my own baby, but, you know, I'm not carrying it. So it was kind of really quite an experience to kind of go through that with your mom. Baby Briar, born November 2nd by emergency C-section, both baby and grandma doing fine. Her name is Briar, Briar Juliet after my mom. So she's, it's just been fantastic. We've had the best two weeks and we just feel so full and complete with her. What a blessing. And when we come back, if only there was a badge for breaking barriers because you're about to meet a young girl who has earned every other scout's achievement. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored, winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor. Overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. COVID-19, what can you do to help protect yourself? Where can you get your questions answered? The new daily podcast from ABC News with Dr. Jennifer Ashton and a team of experts. Listen free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News. News, National Geographic, ESPN, and it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. And finally tonight, meet the teenager in the first class of female Eagle Scouts to earn all 137 merit badges. Our Will Gans has her groundbreaking story. See these? These are my Wilderness Explorer badges. You may notice one is missing. For Russell from the movie Up, maybe, but not for Hannah Holmes of Orlando, Florida. Aviation, basketry, plumbing, scouting heritage. In fact, Hannah has more merit badges than the amount of times most of us have left the house in 2020. Chess. Uh, entrepreneurship, truck transportation, weather. When Scouts BSA, formerly known as Boy Scouts of America, allowed girls to join beginning last year, Hannah leaned in. Whitewater rafting, learning to fire a shotgun, plumbing merit badge, electricity merit badge, where you actually have to solder. A, I had to build a robot. Hannah will be in the first class of female Eagle Scouts this year, an achievement all by itself. To become an Eagle Scout, kids have to get at least 21 badges. Hannah earned them all.
137 of them to be exact. It was 24 seven working around the clock. Um, any car trip, I would be working on pamphlets and merit badge workbooks. When I was in a tent, I would be reading the pamphlets at night or taking merit badge classes online. It's something less than 500 boys have done in the organization's 110 year history. And she's only one of two girls in the country to pull this off since they were allowed to join. It really takes a very uh, driven, focused, uh, high performing individual to uh, achieve that level of excellence. But to achieve this at age 15 is really quite something. There's no badge for breaking glass ceilings, but Hannah is proud regardless. I'm honored, honestly. I'm you know, very happy that I would be able to be one of the first or the first to be able to lead girls in that path. And I hope that there's more to follow. A real trailblazer, our thanks to Will for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, a woman and child simply look on as airline crew wearing full personal protective gear strut through LAX airport. Finding a safe vaccine simply cannot come soon enough. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.